Hi there, and welcome to the Cotswold Explorer. I'm Robin Shuckborough, and we are exploring the beautiful region of the Cotswolds in southwest England, following in the trail of Herbert Evans, who cycled around this region and wrote about his experiences in this wonderful book, The Highways and Byways in Oxford and the Cotswolds, published in 1905, 114 years ago. Today you find Ross, Widget and me in the great town on the western Cotswold called Stroud. The huge success of the raw wool business in the Cotswolds which formed the basis of the wealth of the area resulting in so many of the spectacular homes, estates and churches we see everywhere we look changed quite dramatically after the reign of Henry VIII. Rather than exporting huge quantities of raw wool overseas to be made into cloth and clothing only to re-import it again for our own use, it became obvious that it was far more profitable to make our own cloth. Now Stroud, with its famous five streams that feed the river Frome, which is the river that runs westward through the town, was the perfect place to develop this new industry. The water not only provided the cleansing required in the wool processes, but it powered the many mills required to weave the cloth. So profitable did it become that in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, the export of raw wool was banned altogether. Now, this had a very serious effect on the wool towns of the northern Cotswolds, like Chipping Camden, for example, but for Stroud, it guaranteed a highly prosperous future. The town and its surrounding villages flourished. Like so many of the villages in this region, there are signs of a settlement here from the Iron Age onwards. The Dubani sepulchres, Roman villas and roads all speak of busy communities. But the first proper record of a settlement was in 1221 as La Strode, which probably refers to the marshy ground at the confluence of the River Frome and the Slad Brook. Although certainly the houses were built on the well-drained slopes at the end of the ridge. By 1279, the church had been built, which was to become the centre of the parish by 1304. The first market in Stroud was granted in 1594, and within less than 100 years, it had become the centre of the cloth trade, famous for its high quality, richly dyed broadcloth. In particular, it made military uniforms in what was commonly known as Stroudwater Scarlet. The marketplace, as was often the case in this part of the world, was close to the church. The square known as the Shambles, right in the shadow of the church itself, and still used as a small marketplace, shows signs of the market from about a hundred years or so ago. The table surfaces that fold out from the wall on which the traders displayed their wares, and the drainage grooves in the floor, which took away any blood and detritus from the butcher's stalls. It's all still there for us to see and imagine the noise and smells. It seems there's something in the water of the five streams that feed the valley of the Stroud that engenders radical politics. There's always been a passionate political undercurrent here. In 1837, John Russell became Stroud's MP. He was highly instrumental in designing the Second Reform Act, giving the vote to all urban male householders, not just the rich ones. Hardly universal suffrage, it must be admitted, but it was a step in the right direction. A statue of George Holloway, a highly successful clothing manufacturer, can be found outside the Working Men's Conservative Association Benefit Society, which he founded in the late 1800s. This became the original Holloway Society and set the ground for us all to buy our homes and life insurance by affordable subscription. More recently, the town was one of the birthplaces of the organic food movement and home to the very first organic cafe in Britain. The Biodynamic Agricultural Association is based in the town 
and local politicians lean strongly in the direction of the Green Party. There's also a strong pacifist movement in the town. Such is the depth of local feeling, and so strong is the determination of the local population that it takes a very brave, or possibly foolish, person or organisation to take them on. One of the recent plans by the local council to sell the wonderful subscription rooms building in the centre of the town is a case in point. After an extremely public struggle, the building was saved and is now run by a local trust set up for the purpose, providing music, arts and an amazing venue for everyone in Stroud. Many people tell me the Beatles performed here in the 1960s. I can't actually find any evidence of this, but for me the rumour is easily a good enough reason to protect it. In the late 1700s, a canal was built linking Stroud with the River Severn, and then, a little later, east to the River Thames through the Sapperton Tunnel. This huge improvement in communications, followed by the railways in 1845, meant that the town and its surrounding villages roughly doubled in population. Great mills were constructed along the rivers, in particular that of the Frome running east through Chalford, where the extraordinary settlements hanging on the sides of the valley are wonderful to see. Even in the middle of the 20th century, daily deliveries of bread were made to these houses by donkey, such was the steepness of the terrain. This is true of quite a lot of the valleys around here. There isn't any doubt the feeling and atmosphere of the Stroud region is different from the rural Cotswolds we've visited to date. It is, however, fascinating. And the current gargantuan efforts to restore the canals and mills and tunnels of the area are testament to the beauty and interest of the industrial architecture of the time. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our little trip around Stroud and its surrounding villages. It's a real contrast to quite a lot of the Cotswolds we've seen before. Uh, we've enjoyed it very much here. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. You can keep up with us on social media and we'll keep you informed as to our travels in the future. We look forward to seeing you then.